Hello, let's go ahead and get on with a lecture on integral properties and area. Uh, so so we'll, we'll start off with these integral properties because that'll help us talk about area. Um, and we've actually seen some integral properties before. We've seen uh, the, the simple one, the constant property. And, and so we saw that if we had a constant times a function and we were taking an integral of that, you could, you could pull the constant out front and that would still that would still work out. Um, and so that's the constant property. And then we had the sum and difference property, which was that if you add f of x plus g of x, let's go ahead and put that in some parentheses, you could split that up into two different integrals here. Um, and it could be plus or minus. So we have these two properties. And, and what I wanna point out here, let's go ahead and let's actually move this guy up. So what I wanna point out here is that these properties, uh, we, we looked at them in the context of indefinite integrals. So we didn't have any, any limits on the end of these. We didn't have any limits of integration here. Um, but they do, they do work, in fact, for definite integrals as well. Um, and, and here, what we're actually going to look at the next properties are specific to definite integrals, because really the, the next properties that we're going to see, they have to do with the limits of integration. So you got to have them there. So. Um, just just a very just a very quick reminder when, when we when we have a definite integral so if we write integral from a to b of f of x dx that's going to look like a graph and that graph uh, will be of f of x and then we'll have the function and we're just looking at the area between a and b We could look like that. We've got our function there. And then we're, we're looking at all of this area in the green here. Um, and so that's, that's what this integral represents, the integral from A to B. So keeping, keeping that in mind, let's go ahead and look at, our, uh, at some properties that are specific to definite integrals. So the first should be pretty straightforward. Uh, this, this property states that if I integrate from a constant number a up to a again. So I so my limits of integration are both the same. Then uh, my integral is just zero, and this this should make sense because if we if we have the area underneath a function, you know if we're if we're looking at if we're looking at a graph here, and and this is our function, and and we we want to we want to note the area between a and a, well, I would start there and then I'm just also done there. So there's just, there's no area because I don't actually have, it's not like I have a rectangle of width that I can, that I can talk about. There's no width to this because I'm integrating at the same starting and end point. So if we integrate from a to a, that's going to give us zero. So this, this doesn't come up uh, very often, it happens occasionally, maybe in your work, um, you just happen to have something like this and you can look at it and say, hey, look, that's zero. Um, but it's useful to know that it doesn't matter. If, I, if my limits of integration are the same, then um, it's equal to zero there. Um, so now let's move on to the next uh, property that's specific to definite integrals. So here, this is gonna be kind of a uh, like a let's break up the interval that we're talking about here. So let's say that let's say I have three numbers a, b and c and a is smaller than b which is smaller than c. So they they go in uh, ascending order. So for example, we might have we might have something that looks like this. We might have a graph, we might have our function, maybe we have a, b and c right there. Well, if we're trying to find the integral from a to c, what you could do is you could you could basically pick any point in between a and c. In this case, we're going to call that point b, and you could break up that integral into two different integrals. So what we'll notice is this integral from a to c, that's going to look like this. It's going to be everything in the blue. So everything in that blue area. But what I could do instead is I could say, hey, 
let's just break this up. Let's go from A to B and look at the purple there. And then separately, let's look at B to C in the orange. And if we add the purple and the orange together, that's going to give me the blue. And so um, in this scenario, really all we're doing is we're saying, hey, I've got a, a limit. Uh, I've got limits of integration that go from A to C. And for whatever reason we decide, we want to break it up. So instead of going from A to C, we go from A to B and then B to C. And so, so you can see that right there. And we're obviously adding those together. So it's basically just saying um, blue is equal to, uh, we've got purple plus orange. That's what each of those, each of those integrals correspond to those colors down on that graph right there. So uh, this is our other property of definite integrals. And we have uh, one more property. Um, and this states that we have uh, an integral from A to B is equal to negative the integral from B to A. So basically how you can think about this is just if you flip the limits of integration, it, it'll, it'll attack on a negative sign here. Graphically, this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to, to do a graph of. What's probably a little bit better is just to write out an example. Let's say I gave you an integral that looked like five to three of x squared dx. Well, five to three looks a little weird. Uh, because obviously five is greater than three. And usually we start at the smaller value and we go up, we move from left to right, typically not from right to left. So what you might do here, just as a first step of solving this integral is you might say, you know what, it's gonna look a lot nicer. It's gonna just make a lot more sense. It's gonna seem cleaner. If I just flip that three and that five at the expense of this negative sign that gets tacked on there. And then at this point, now we now everything just looks a little better. We can go on and we can do our integral there. So that's all I mean here by that we typically use it when our limits of integration are out of order. Maybe if they're flipped, if they just look weird. Otherwise, you tend not to bother with this property. Um, yeah, so we're mostly going to focus on this property here, actually, in this area application that, that I briefly mentioned in the beginning of the lecture. Um, so let's let, let's keep this in mind, this idea that we can we can split up an integral into really as many parts as we want. It doesn't just have to be two. I could split this up into a whole bunch of different parts. Um, I could split one integral into several different integrals as long as I just keep keep on editing those limits appropriately. So keep this guy in mind and let's go ahead and, and start talking about area. The very first thing that I wanna say about area is actually in the naming of these problems. Uh, for, for the next two lectures, for this lecture and the next one, uh, it, it's gonna be a little, it's gonna be a little bit confusing in terms of the problems that are being asked. Um, as you do more and more of them, you'll start to notice the, the key differences between them, but the wording is very similar. So on our problems during this lecture, we're gonna be talking about finding just area. And that has a very different meaning of what we'll be talking about next time, which will be the area between two curves. These are very different things. The area between two curves we'll get into next time, but here I just wanna talk about this idea of area. Um, and so when we're talking about area, the first thing that we'll, that we'll mention is that we have a function here and I've just drawn just a portion of the function and you'll notice it crosses the X axis at this point right here. And when we wanna find the area, what I'm saying here is that I want to find the green and I want to find this purple. And I don't care that the green is below the axis and that the purple is above the axis. All I want to know is just how much space is occupied in the green and the purple. And so that's, this, that's the big thing about finding area. That's the, that's the very big thing. Here. So if we, if we wanna try and find area, we could come up with, with some, some ideas, some guesses, at, at, uh, at some formulas of ways to do this. And, and a lot of them will be wrong. And so I'll call them issues here um, because they just don't quite work. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and look at this. Let, let's take a guess. Let's say, all right, if I wanna find how much area is here in the green and the purple, 
then l why don't we just try taking the integral, right? We, we've said before, hey, integral means area. You know, we, we recognize that the integral from A to B is going to talk about the area between, you know, the area of this function in between the, these regions here. But the problem with this is that this green is gonna be negative. And when we do this integral, it's going to count this as negative because it is below the axis. So for example, maybe you'll, you'll get something like negative 10 and then you'll get three for those areas. This green area looks a little bit larger than the blue. So if you were to do this integral here, you would end up with negative 10, plus three, notice the integral property that I'm doing there. I'm just looking at each portion separately. And this would give us a, an area of negative seven, but clearly that doesn't work because if we just wanna find out how much space is being occupied here, it's not gonna be negative right there. So doing this integral doesn't quite work out here, just taking the integral of f of x, because it's going to count to this as negative. And when we're just looking at the space that is being occupied, we don't want to count any space as negative. So um, what we could, we could continue on. We could say, well, hey, look, you had negative here. So what if we just took an absolute value of it? What if we just said, hey, instead of counting this as a negative 10, what if we just what if we just took the absolute value? And so this leads me to an idea of let's just do the integral. And then let's just take an absolute value of it. We took that, that answer that we got before and we, and we just make it positive. Well, that doesn't quite work either. And the reason is because that doesn't actually treat this region and this region differently. And obviously these are very different regions. One's positive, one's negative. But just absolute valuing the whole integral itself that doesn't quite work because that's just me taking the integral, getting an answer, and then just taking the magnitude of that answer. That doesn't actually treat this green region as anything different. So what we want to do, what this leads me to think about is, I want to treat this green region as though, as, as though it's positive. So it would be wonderful if I changed my function to look like this. And you'll notice there that I'm just mirroring it. I'm just mirroring the function as, as such right here. I'm just copying it. But what I'm doing is I'm making it above the axis instead of below the axis. And, and maybe, maybe this looks a little bit, little bit bigger than that. But um, the idea is that this is just supposed to be a reflection right there. And so what I'm actually doing here is I'm actually taking the absolute value of the function itself of just f of x, not the entire integral. I'm not taking the, the absolute value of the integral, but I'm taking the absolute value of just the function. For, for comparison, you could think about the graph of just x and the graph of absolute value of x. So this is a graph of just x. Let's make that a little bit better there. So that's a graph of x. And then absolute value of x, it looks the same on the, on the right side where, where this function is positive. But then what we do is instead of drawing it down here, we actually just reflect it across this axis. We just mirror it up and down and it's just reflected. And so you'll note, you, you notice this difference here between f of x equals x, and let's call it g of x equals absolute value of x. That's just what we're doing. We're just mirroring. And so this, that's what we want to do here. So what we'll notice is that to find the area, the space that is occupied by the green and the purple, we want to take the absolute value of our function and then do the integral of that. But we have to be careful when we actually evaluate this and when we actually go, go about and do this. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, we're, we're going we're gonna to use our integral properties. We're going to go back and we're going to look at those integral properties. And really, we're going to use the one that says, hey, I can split up my integral. Instead of going from here to here, from A to B, I'm going to do one integral from A to this point here. Let's just put a star there. And then I'm going to go from star to B. And when I do each of those integrals, you'll notice that that's treating the green as one integral 
and the purple is the nutter. And so that's what we want to do. And when we get the answer for this green interval, or excuse me, green integral, obviously it will be negative. We're just going to make it positive. Um, and so, so we'll, we'll do some examples of that where basically we're just going to look at this function. We're going to say, hey, let's find where it crosses the x-axis, figure out where it's negative, figure out where it's positive, take all those negative integrals and just make them positive after you do them. And so um, we'll, we'll look at that in just a second. What I actually um, want, want, want you to do is I want you to, to work on this exercise on your own time. Take this function x squared minus 4. I want you to sketch and evaluate all of the following integrals. So first, just do the integral from 0 to 3, nice and normal. Then do the integral from 0 to 3, but then take an absolute value of that answer. So you'll notice that this guy right here is just take this and take an absolute value of it. Then what I want you to do is I want you to evaluate this guy right here, which I'm rewriting for you. I'm helping you out. It's just this, so you can do each of these integrals separately. And we'll see how I'm actually taking this and splitting it up like that. Um, but for now, basically just evaluate each of these. Let's go ahead and box them. Evaluate that, take the absolute value of it, and then separately do this. And you're gonna notice that you get very different answers for all three of them. And that's exactly what we're going at uh, or what we're getting at in these ideas of these issues that we've seen with this graph. So. Before we do an example, let's kind of go over our steps. When we want to find the area, when we want to find just the space that is occupied, we need to, we need to consider things that are above and below the x-axis completely differently. We need to separate them. We've got to deal with them independently. And so what we're going to, what we're going to say is, obviously, the regions where the function is positive, the regions where it's above the x-axis, that's going to yield a positive integral. So that's fine. That just gives us positive area. We're good. That tells us the space that is occupied. But the regions where the function is negative, if you take the integral, you're going to get a negative answer. But we don't want to count that answer as negative. We want to count that as positive. So all you're going to do is you're just going to flip it. You're just going to change it from a negative to a positive. And then you just add up all those areas that you get right there. Um, so let's go ahead and do an example. And I, and I will, I will uh, uh, make sort of a note that I, I do this maybe a little bit differently than other people. Um, that it's fine. It, it's the, you get the same answer. It's really doing the same thing. I just write it a little bit differently. So um, I'll, I'll make a note of, of where I'm doing that. Uh, in this example. So let's say that I ask you to find the area between the x-axis and then the function f of x equals e to the x minus 1. And we're just going to look on the interval between negative 1 and 2. Take note now of this format of how the problem is worded. Uh, we'll want to compare that with the next lecture, and we'll want to remind ourselves about the wording of these of these problems and what which one means uh, which type of lecture and which type of problem we're talking about. So here, find the area between the x-axis and this function. And so the first thing that we have to figure out is we got to say, all right, where is this function positive? Where is this function negative? Um, because if the function is ever negative on this interval, then we're going to have to deal with you know, doing that integral separately. So it would be wonderful if we could graph this. And graphing is going to be key here. We're we're going to want to we're going to want to be be really comfortable with graphing these functions. So let's go ahead. Let's let's do a quick a quick sketch here. So e to the x we know is an exponential, and when I subtract one from it, that's going to just shift it down vertically just a little bit. So I'll actually go ahead. Because, because I can, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just start off by graphing e to the x. Actually, that's really all we need right there. So let's, let's go ahead and graph e to the x. And just a very quick sketch there. And now I'm actually, so this right here is e to the x. I'm just going to shift this, shift this down here. Let me include all of that. So I'm, all I'm going to do is, you'll notice I have that y-intercept at 1. I'm just going to shift this down so that that y-intercept is 0 right there. So I just shifted that. That's OK. That's all good. This is now a graph 
of e to the x minus one. And so when we do this, we're trying to find the, the area between the x-axis and, uh, and, and this function. And we're looking on the interval from negative one to two. Not quite to scale, but that's okay. So we've got this. And when we're looking at these areas here, we're going to have a first area in this blue here. And you'll notice that that's negative. And I'm going between negative 1 and 0 right there. And then I'll go ahead and do this in purple. We're going to have the area from 0 up to 2. So we'll have, we'll have all that in there. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to, we're going to want to calculate the purple and the blue areas independently. But when we, when we actually calculate these, obviously the purple area is going to end up yielding a positive result. And so we'll just leave it as positive. But the blue is going to end up yielding a negative result. And so that's where we want to be careful here because with that negative result for the blue, we don't want to count that area as negative. We want to count it as positive. And so we're just going to flip it. So what, what, I, what I actually would probably encourage you to do is just do each of these integrals separately. Do them, do them on two separate pieces of paper and then bring them together in, you know, in your final work. Um, I, I don't quite do it that way. I do things a little bit, a little bit differently. Um, but I, I actually would probably recommend um, do, doing this where you just, hey, do this blue integral, do the purple integral, do them totally separately, and then just bring them together. So um, let's, let's, go ahead, let's go ahead and work this out. Um, I, I'll show you guys kind of how, how I do this. Um, with a graph here, this is nice and easy. We can very easily see that my x-intercept and my only x-intercept is at zero. We can see very clearly where the function is negative and where the function is positive. But let's say I gave you something that was tough to graph, or maybe you couldn't even graph it. Maybe you don't know how to graph it. You could do this with a number line instead. You could, you could find x-intercepts first off by setting the function equal to zero. So you could just say, hey, zero is equal to e to the x minus one. So e to the x is equal to one. That means x is zero. Boom, this is, a, this is an x-intercept and we're all fine and dandy and we, we've got our answer right there. So um, you could do that. We've found that x-intercept algebraically now, very simply, uh, very simply. And then what you could do is you could go back to number lines. Right? We've, we've seen number lines before um, when we're talking about graphs and x-intercepts and things of that nature. And so here what you could do is you could graph from negative one to two just on a number line for f of x. And you could just make some test points. And you'll notice that if you plug in something like negative one half into this function, you're gonna get ne a negative answer. If you plug in something like one into here, you're gonna get a positive answer. And so this tells us where the function is negative and positive. And here we haven't even bothered graphing it. Um, obviously graphing is very easy. Um, if, you, if the function allows you to, but if the function is difficult and complicated or you don't know how to graph it, um, the, these number lines will will do it will do a great job there. So um, this is how I interpret this right now, and this is maybe a little bit differently than just splitting up the integral into two different parts um, on two separate pieces of paper, doing each integral separately. What I say is, all right, this integral from negative one to zero, it's going to give me a negative answer. So what I'm going to do at the end of it is I'm just going to make it negative. In the when it's all said and done. So I just do that right here. This negative sign is me making this integral negative just, but I'm doing it right from the get-go. Rather than doing the integral from negative one to zero, getting a negative answer and then make and then flipping that, I just throw my negative sign in right off the bat right there. And then obviously I can do my integral from zero to two just normally, hey, f of x, because we know that that region is positive, then I can add each of those integrals together. And so we're all good there. So let's go, let's go ahead and, and look at this. So uh, this will be, this will be kind of a, kind of a lot of work. Uh, let's, let's actually go ahead and, and do this on a separate piece of paper or on a separate sheet here. So we'll have the area. Remember from 
negative one to zero, that was that the function was negative. So I just basically want to flip that function. I want to make it negative f of x. And then we're going to add to that the integral from zero to two. And you notice we're using our integral property here. We're taking the integral and we're, we're splitting it up amongst zero. Obviously, this negative here doesn't have anything to do with the integral property. Um, in general, you wouldn't have that there if you're just doing the integral property. But here for this problem, because we're being asked to find area, we have to include that in. But this is kind of kind of a maybe a, a slightly varied uh, uh, method of this integral property there. So when we do this, let's let's go ahead and, and actually just evaluate this out. We have the integral from negative one to zero of negative f of x, and we'll remember that f of x was e to the x minus one. So when I make that negative, it's just me flipping it, just one minus e to the x dx, plus the integral from zero to two of e to the x minus one. And then uh, at this point here, um, you you're basically you're basically just done. They, these are very simple integrals that we can that we can evaluate. Um, you can go ahead and get an answer out from this. I guess if we wanted to to make it even more clear and add one more step in, we could we could write this. We could say, hey, negative, and here's f of x, just that e to the x minus one. And then I'm just distributing that negative in, giving me the one minus e to the x. At this point here, you can do your integral and everything. And, and that's something that, that we should be pretty comfortable with. You end up getting a nice answer here. You should always check that this answer is positive. Um, you definitely need a positive answer here for our areas because we are talking about space being occupied. Um, so should be positive. In fact, this is uh, this would be our answer right here. And we, we'd go ahead and just move on to the to the next problem there. So um, that's this idea of area. As I've said, you can do each of these integrals completely separately. Um, I like to just do them kind of at all in one fell swoop all at the same time. And I just throw in a negative sign right there. But really with this idea of area, we're just keeping in mind this idea that we, we can kind of use an integral property like we did back here to sort of split the integral up. Obviously we have to do some funky things where we make this uh, positive instead of negative, but we're starting off with this idea of an integral property, knowing that when I integrate from negative one to two, I can split it up among uh, that zero in the middle. So that's gonna be, that's gonna be the lecture here. Um, basically when you're doing these problems is to go back here, you're, you got you to gotta find the regions where your function is positive and where your function is negative. That may be difficult. Um, a graph might help. Uh, algebraically, it might, that might be the way to go. It just really depends on the function that I give you. Um, but depending on the function I give you, you'll do a graph or you'll make a number line and that'll tell you where your function is positive and negative. For those negative regions, when you take your integral, you're gonna count those integrals as positive instead of negative. Take all of your areas, take all of your space occupied calculations, and then you're just gonna add them all up and that'll be your answer. So uh, that'll be our lecture on area. Uh, and we'll move on uh, to future lectures, and but that'll be it for here.